Well, good morning. Thank you for being here. My name is Tom Lyons. Um, I grew up in Quincy. I went to um, Quincy schools until they found out I needed a little more discipline. And then I went to St. Anne's and Archbishop Williams. But I was in one of the first classes here, and I'm guessing it was 1956. I grew up a stone's throw away here on William Street, on Russell Street. Absolutely love Quincy. To this day, 67 years later, I still, on a monthly basis, get together with Quincy friends. Quincy friends. In our heart, we haven't changed one bit, even though they all look a little older than I do. You know? So, I grew up in a firefighter's home, which is extremely important, for me at any rate. And it got me started on a vocation, quite frankly. Um, my father was a captain in the Quincy Fire Department, and long before smoke detectors existed, long before what's called Edith, exit drills in the home, my father had a plan to evacuate us in the event of a fire, okay? Um, we all had a window to get out of. Uh, there, was, uh, there was always one window that was easier to open, 12 months a year. There were no cell phones then. My job was to run to Ocean Street. If we had a fire, there was a street call box. My job, which was a lot of responsibility for a six-year-old, was to go and activate that box if we had a fire. So I grew up in that consciousness. He would come home and share incidents or potential ignition sources and fires that he had accounted, uh, encountered. So consider that I've grown up in that atmosphere and that will come into play in a little bit. Um, I went on to Northeastern, I graduated. Uh, like so many graduates, uh, graduates, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I knew my father loved this job, he loved this city, he loved extending himself for the welfare of others and consequently that's what I wanted to do. He retired in 1975 I went on the job in 1978. For the first 16 years of my career, I was on the trucks as a firefighter and a lieutenant. That's where I got all my experience. That's where I got the tremendous urge to make a difference for people as it, when it, as it pertains to fire safety and all. Um, my latter 16 years as a captain, I managed Fire Prevention Bureau. Uh, it, totally different. I love suppression on the trucks, but I felt that I was better suited for there, particularly with the passion I had to try to proactively convince people that fire in their lives wasn't worth it. Okay? Now, along those 16 years, I had an epiphany, and that epiphany was that I grew up in a household a fire safety consciousness. Most people don't. Most people don't know the little innuendos, the little situations that create fire, that avail us to, to, to fire. So what I began was, I went to Henry uh, Bosworth, the Quincy Sun, the owner and editor at the time, and I asked him if I could write a column. So for four years, on a, I wrote a weekly column under my name at the time, Captain Lyons. Later, Mark was pursuing me to get on to Quincy Ac Access TV, okay? And Mark and I created, co-created, co-produced 40 programs on fire, on fire safety. That began my urge to try to make a difference for people because you can't inspect every premise. In fact, the only time we would go to your house is if we had a sign off and a permit or if you sell your house. And I'll, I'll get to that later, okay? Um, after I retired in 2010, loving the subject matter, I went to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and I was their fire safety administrator for 11 years. 
doing the same thing, training people uh, for the welfare of our patients and for the welfare of the employees. Last year, I retired in July. And if you remember July, it was extremely, particularly the summer, it was extremely dry. And there were a tremendous amount of fires. And you might recall there was down one in Hingham, where someone had built a large home. The home was near completion. A worker went outside, had a cigarette, didn't properly extinguish it. There was a fire adjacent to the home and it extended right through the home and it was a total loss. At around that same time, down in Nantucket, there was the oldest hotel in existence on Nantucket. It was called the Veranda House Hotel. Same thing. Someone went out on a porch, a deck, they took a cigarette, not prob uh, properly disposed of, and the building, they lost the entire building. Extremely dry atmosphere, extremely dry vegetation. And in, in Quincy, at uh, one of the lodging homes, which I had sprinkled in 1994, there was a fire on Bigelow Street where you could tell by the burn pattern it started outside and ran right up the side of the building. So what sort of impact did it have on me? I was no longer working, I was going to be happily retired, and yet I knew all the articles I wrote for the Quincy Sun was still relevant. I thought about that. So I got to work, I reviewed all those articles, the ones I wanted to choose, and I put them in this, in this book. Okay? So now I am on the circuit. Now, by the way, before I actually begin, I want to explain to you that the city of Quincy is pursuing a grant to make this book available to you at no cost. Now, I don't know where they are at that, they're, 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 they're eventually going to order a thousand books. They're going to be placed at all eight fire stations for you to pick up and they're going to be placed here as well. Now when that will happen I don't know. I hope it comes to fruition in October where Fire Prevention Week lies in, in, in October. So in terms of the book, what, I'll read the introduction, but I want to give you an idea of what articles are included within it. And this will mean something, because I'm going to read some of these. Isolating combustibles from potential ignition sources. Typically, every fire happens when someone inadvertently has an ignition source of some sorts, whether it's through failure, failure or intent, and there's a combustible adjacent to it. Basement bedrooms. I'm going to read you an article on the ha potential hazards of basin, basement bedrooms. Propane grills. You don't know the work that I attempted to do to keep propane grills off of balconies and in condos off of balconies as well. It was like corralling cats. The state fire marshal, it's actually illegal to have a propane grill above the ground level. I'd no sooner get so many off and more would come in. Um, smoke detectors, I'm going to get involved in that and what you are required to do if you sell your home. Fire extinguishers. Senior fire safety, and I'm going to read something here. I too am a senior, okay? And I'm going to read something that's the only frightening thing I'm going to share here. Forty years ago, people aged 65 and older made up 18% of the total fire deaths in the U.S. By 2018, that age group comprised 36% of all fire deaths. Seniors, you and I. According to the NFPA statistics, all told, older adults are now twice as likely as general population to experience a fatal fire. That's the most frightening thing I'm going to say here. Because what I'm about to share empowers you, what this book will share, it empowers you to create a, self, uh, a safer household. Fair enough? So, power strips, dryer fires, um, space heaters. I've had many fires in space heaters. The importance of house numbers. Unattended cooking, unattended candles, etc. On and on and on. There's an article on each of these within this book. 
So if I may, let me read a portion of the introduction and give you some idea of the intent, my intent of writing this and putting it together. Many of the articles that follow were written for residences of a city within the state of Massachusetts, Quincy. While that fact does not negate their applicable use for the welfare of any reader at any other location. They include sound advice on keeping you and your home safer from the devastating effects of fire. These articles are an attempt to positively impact the behavioral patterns, which I'm going to get into, that lead to accidental fire and preparations to avoid and detect its presence should it occur. Meanwhile, I hope that through this book you will discover a path to a safer household, whether through changes in your own behavioral patterns that potentially lead to fire, additions to early warning notification devices like carbon monoxide detectors and smoke detectors, or proactive considerations regarding your evacuation options during an emergency. Every fatality I witnessed while I was in the fire service, it was obvious there was no proactive attempt on the victim to say what should I do if I wake up in a fire. 99 and 9 tenths of people will respond the way they leave their house on a Sunday through a Monday. When you have windows, I'm going to give you an example later on, on, on this. Um, I'm looking to instill within you that ounce of prevention that comes from Ben Franklin that will lessen the possibility that you will become a victim of fire and that your efforts maintaining that level of safety will become a routine. That's the key, a routine pattern in your lives. Okay? I'm going to give you an example. Now, this is an article I wrote, and it was about my mother in law. And when she heard this, she was not happy whatsoever. And I like my mother in law, don't get me wrong. I'd like to take this opportunity to explain to you what I specifically mean by behavioral patterns that place us at a higher risk with fire, while conveying a few examples here as well. Years ago, I must have had a discussion with my mother-in-law, discouraging her from her habit of placing combustibles, newspapers especially. She was an avid reader of the New York Times. She used to place them on the stovetop on the left side of the stovetop. She was in a condo, 550 square feet. She used to use that as a counter. At the time, she had an electric stove within a small working kitchen, while apparently using that space was convenient. After our discussion, she dis discontinued that practice because I talked to her and I explained the hazard. You've got an ignition source here, and look at the combustibles you have adjacent to it. Months later, she became aware that she accidentally left the burner on all day uh, prior to when she left the, uh, the condo. She returned home to discover it so, while she later conceded that if she had continued the habit of using the stovetop as a counter, she would have lost the home, as would have, <coughs> sorry, as adjacent homeowners would as well, okay? She consciously changed that behavior and she avoided that, that fire. In this instance, she had a behavioral pattern where she placed combustibles onto a potential ignition source. She then had to consciously remind herself of the risk in doing so to break that habit. She did, while she saw the fruits of that effort one day when the ignition stove, ignition source, the stovetop burner was left on and unattended. Simply put, this is an example of successful proactive fire prevention. Some effort was applied to changing the habit, consequently a behavioral pattern was changed and a tragedy was averted. It's a success story. What are some of the other risky behavioral patterns? Statistics tell us a great deal. Smoking while lying on the couch or on a mattress is an invitation for a disaster. I can't tell you how many buildings, how many occupancies I responded to where people were smoking, they fell asleep, and many of them succumbed to, to fire. Um, a common scenario and leading, leading cause of home fire deaths. To eliminate such a practice is a step towards a safer home and one's personal welfare. Looking, leaving cooking unattended is a common cause of home fires. It's the number one cause of home fires. And what I do when I give a presentation is, 
If you should leave the kitchen. Let, let me give you my own example. If someone knocked on my door when I was making a breakfast and I answered that door, I would address that person, the person would leave, then I'd say, geez, I've got to cut the lawn. And I would leave. Okay, that's the way my mind thinks. What I've encouraged people over the years is to take an appliance with you. Something from the kitchen, a spatula, a kitchen towel, drape it over. If you have to answer the door, answer the door, and that will remind you of your effort in the kitchen. 49% of fires in homes start, it used to be 60%, so maybe my talks are doing some good. 49% of these fires start unattended cooking in the kitchen. Okay? Um, let me see. Loading seasonal appliances on power strips. I made a big effort at Dana Farber. Power strips, you know what I mean by power strips? Power strips are made for electronic equipment. I've had fires with aquariums, believe it or not, two fires with aquariums plugged into them. I had a fire with a Coke machine that was plugged into them. And other fires, it overwhelms them. It overwhelms them. They are made for um, electronics, computers, your stereos, etc. In fact, OSHA has a standard telling you exactly that they shouldn't be used for that. Meanwhile, people have air conditioners plugged into them, uh, space heaters, space heaters, which is a whole other story, which are not made for types of electrical current drawn by air conditioners or space heaters. Uh, leaving candles unattended. Most of us no longer are used to open flame. My father's time, they were. A stove had a flame in it. They were using range oil. They were using flame all the time. They were conscious of safety using that flame. Now if we lose an electricity, we might put on a candle. Well, so often, and this is a scenario leading to fatalities, people forget the candle and they go to bed, etc., cetera, and um, succumb to that fire. Grilling on decks and porches rather than doing so further away from the house. There was a police officer, I wrote this article on that, and there happened to be a police officer that got severely burned. He had his deck on his upper, upper level attached to his garage. He went inside, came out. Um, the fire from the propane grill extended to his garage, and he was severely burned. I saw his father in the street, and he said, Captain, I told him. You should have, you read that article. You should be reading that and adhere to those practices. So one might argue that I've been doing something a certain way for years without an incident. Maybe you have. Maybe you've been lucky so far or on the uneventful side of statistics. M meanwhile, it doesn't take much time or effort to scrutinize our behavior and take steps towards safer choices in our routine. Please consider, consider doing so. Okay? I naturally, if I'm going to charge a cell phone, I'm very, I'm very aware of where I place it. It doesn't take me any energy. Because you can take, we've had fires where you can take a charging cell phone, put it on a pillow, where the heat created by, the, by that charge cannot dissipate, and it will create a fire. Okay? Um, I might charge my phone on the counter at the kitchen. The paper towels will be next to it. The chances are remote that that charging phone is going to ignite that, that paper towels. But in my mind, I'd like distance. So I create distance. We don't use candles in our house, but whenever we have in the past, I happen to put it right in the stove. It can't extend anywhere on the stove. Commercially, any restaurant commercially that, that creates um, grease-lading vapors, has to have a hood and they have to have a suppression system within it. Tremendously effective. Um, in fire prevention, as an inspector, I researched many of them after the fact and um, tremendously effective if they are maintained. All right, basements and bedrooms. Some people decades ago maybe said, look at all the room in the basement, we're going to make a bedroom. Okay, seems like a good idea. Years ago, I, require, I recall a fire where a child was sleeping in a basement bedroom. It was a single family home. The only access to that basement was down an interior stairwell. 
There were basement windows, none of which would conform to the size and the height to be considered emergency egresses. If a window is a certain distance off the floor and a certain width, the opening, and a certain height, that is considered an emergency egress. A cellar window, that you typical cellar window, which is this big, this big, and five feet off the cement floor, that is not an emergency egress. That's what this individual had in their basement. It would not conform to building code, um, would allow and consider as emergency exit. If need be, the windows were much too high off the floor and much too small for anyone to escape through. A building inspector would never have approved the bedroom arrangement. In this instance, at the base of the stairwell, on the left, as, you, as he descended the stairs, there was a relatively small utility room containing a furnace and a water heater. This was a finished basement. On the right was a hallway leading to the bedroom. So you come down the stairs, there was paneling, a door with no fire rating, a furnace inside there. Take a right, you go along paneling, a paneled corridor, open to a bedroom. During the night, while the child, he was 12 years old, was sleeping, a fire started within that utility room. I can't recall the cause of the fire at this time. There was no smoke detector at the base of the stairwell. As you descend the stairwell into a basement, look up, there should be a smoke detector right there. There was one there, but there was no battery there. Um, there was no smoke detector at the base of the stairs to alert the child as the smoke escaped through the small openings around the door frame and above the petition. Thankfully at that time the, the utility room door was closed. That makes a difference. That gives you time to escape. As the fire grew, the heat would have built up quickly within that small room. Miraculously, that heat melted the copper tubing the copper uh, solder on a water pipe near the ceiling. The water pipe joint separated and the water sprayed into the room onto the fire. The fire was suppressed as if the sprinkler head had operated over it. It was the noise of the spray. Now meanwhile the child is sleeping in a smoke, totally consumed room with smoke. It was the noise of the spray which woke the child up. No smoke detector. Although I did not speak with the boy, I understand that he ran out past the utility room, the only access to the exit, only access, notifying the rest of the family to evacuate as well. As I write this, I am still amazed at his good fortune. That is the first and only time I have witnessed a water pipe fail in that murder, in that um, manner during a fire. If that had not occurred, the smoke would have built up quickly towards untenable conditions, even with that door closed, while the heat and fire would have made escape through that hallway and up that stairwell impossible. I witnessed the triple fatality the same way. The point is, before you consider utilizing a basement space for additional sleeping area, consider first whether you have the appropriate exiting arrangements to do so. I suggest you contact your local building department and ask for their determination. It is too easy to consider using this space for sleeping without considering the consequences should an emergency arise. I certainly wouldn't rely on melting solder to act as protection. This child was quite fortunate while the family learned a valuable lesson as well. Fortunately, a lesson learned without the loss of a family member. Okay? Fires do occur. Smoke detectors, I assume you all have them. You know, smoke detectors surfaced, surfaced in the 1970s. And um, they were generally ionization type. And in the state of Massachusetts, the, the state fire marshal, Department of Fire Service, they basically told you where to put them. That was it. Since then, they have evolved tremendously. Depending upon when your house was built, in fact, me let, me let me give you a rundown. And I don't expect you to remember this. I can't remember it, quite frankly. Smoke detectors were first marketed in the 70s. The um, chapter 148 at the time, the Mass General Law, told you where to put them. 
then that duty was transferred to the building department. That was 1975. Condos required hardwired in 1981 and interconnected. On all new construction from 75 to 97, hardwired, they had to be hardwired and interconnected. So the batteries weren't any good. They were because they're grandfathered in older occupancies, and I'll help you out with that. Battery backup required in 1998. Nicole's Law for COs, 2006. And currently in 2010, you have to have a specific type of smoke detector, and I'm going to share that with you right now. Okay? So I used to have to train the firefighters that would inspect your premise because you need a certificate from the fire department to sell your home. And I would try to have to try to explain this to them. Just how smoke detectors evolved. So, here's an article that I wrote to inform realtors that the Massachusetts State Fire Marshal had modified the requirements specified in the Mass General Law for the first time, the modification specified what type of smoke detector should be used and specifically where each specific type should be placed. Now, after I read this, if you consider selling your home in the future and you are confused by this, which is very easy to, to, to do, call the Quincy Fire Prevention Bureau. The number is 617-376-1015. I used to answer, people would say, Captain, what do I do to comply with the law? And I would explain over the phone exactly uh, what they had to do. The number 617-376-1015. I used to answer that question daily, daily. The location of a smoke detector within an existing structure has not changed. In older residences, those having built prior to the 6th and 7th edition of the State Building Code. In other words, older homes. Approved smoke detectors shall be installed on the ceiling of each stairway leading to the floor above, near the base of that stairwell, but not within each stairwell. An approved smoke detector shall be installed outside each separate sleeping area. So, let's say you have a home like I grew up in, built in 1920. We had a smoke detector at the, on the ceiling at the base of the cellar stairs. When we were down the cellar stairs, before you ascended, look up. There were no bedrooms on the first floor. There was a stairwell to the second floor. At the base of that stairwell, we had a smoke detector. As you ascended the stairs, there were three bedrooms. There was a smoke detector in the little common um, hallway on the ceiling. That covered it. The newly accepted re regulation now specifies the type of smoke detector that can be used in an existing homes. Now this does apply to you. This change has no impact on the placement of carbon monoxide detectors. Within 20 feet of an entryway to a kitchen or a bathroom containing a bathtub or shower. So a photoelectric smoke detector is the only type that may be used. So let me, let me give this, um, let me explain the, my own home years ago. On the basement, forget the basement for the time being, on the first floor we had a kitchen. The smoke detector on that level had to be photoelectric because within 20 feet of that smoke detector there was a kitchen. On the second floor we had a bathroom with a shower. That smoke detector had to be photoelectric as well. The reason being, photoelectric are less apt to be activated by nuisance, by smoke from cooking, by steam from a bathroom. So photoelectric is the preferred detector. Um, outside of 20 feet, this is just unbelievable, from the entry to a kitchen or bathroom, a smoke detector that employs both ionization and photoelectric might, must be used. Now, I don't know if the department is now enforcing that. In my house, I happen to have that. But once again, if you are going to sell your home or if you have any interest in determining whether you have the proper smoke detectors in the proper location, call that number I gave you. Okay? 
Um, ionization detectors can no longer be used within 20 feet of a kitchen and bathroom. Why? Studies have shown that false alarms from cooking and bathroom steam occur more frequently with ionization detectors. While photoelectric smoke detectors are more effective detecting smoldering type fires which you have in your house. Those more frequently occurring within your home. It appears that the state fire marshal wants homeowners to get current with the findings from the studies. Meanwhile, we are available, meaning fire prevention, to assist you in, in uh, updating the information. Fire extinguishers, great device. I can't tell you the fires I responded to in my career where we responded to a kitchen fire and what we found is not only a stovetop appliance on fire but a, a kitchen towel on fire as well. Because what people typically do is they take a, a towel, they drape it over the stovetop pan that's on fire typically with oil, and the towel is now going as well. Okay, 99% of the time that's what I saw. Um, what I recommend in cooking, I'm getting ahead of myself, but what I recommend with cooking is if you're going to cook on the stove top, take the top out, take the, top, take the lid of the pan out. And if in fact the fire does, is created because of the oil, etc., just take it and smother it. Try, try to avoid moving it, catching drapery on fire, etc. Just cover it and shut off the, the power. But what I'm talking now about is extinguishers. I have them all over my house. Okay? I believe one of the best investments that you can make for your home is a fire extinguisher. They are an effective tool on small fires before they become larger and more destructive. Years ago, I used to conduct an occasional presentation on home safety, and I'd always encourage people to obtain one and hang it in a proper location. Using a fire extinguisher properly might seem complicated, but for household purposes, I can, I, I can simplify that use here. They are only effective if you know where they are and how to use one. I wish I had one in here. There are three typical classes of fires you're going to have in a home. Class A, trash barrel, paper, etc., cardboard. B, flammable liquids. C, energized electrical equipment. You can purchase a household extinguisher, let's say at Lowe's or Home Depot, suitable for all three classes of fire. If you ask for a multi-purpose A, B, and C model, okay? They come in two pound, they come in two and a half pound, they come in five pound. A two and a half pound extinguisher is quite adequate for your house. You can then avoid using the wrong type of extinguisher on a certain classifier where an ABC extinguisher is suitable for all classes. It is then quite important to install an extinguisher in an appropriate location. This is important. You want it in an area where you consider it might be needed but not too close to the potential problem. For instance, if you want one for your use in your kitchen, don't put it too close to the stove or appliance where a fire might make it impossible to gain access to. Most importantly, mount it near an escape route. Extremely important. And here's the idea. You have a fire. I have an extinguisher. Near my exit, I grab it. I go back. The fire overwhelms me. I want nothing to do with it. Leave. I'm going to tell you a story. It had nothing to do with an extinguisher. Two gentlemen went to the bake, basement of a bakery in this city decades ago. They poured the basement with gasoline. They loaded it with gasoline. Did they light the gasoline from the stairwell and leave? No. They lit it from the furthest corner and they never got out of there. So in terms of an extinguisher, you're, always, you're talking a small incidental fire you and the exit behind you. Um, let me see. Most importantly, mount it near an escape route. In the event of a small fire, you don't want it to, to place yourself further into a room away from the exits to gain access to it. You want to be near an exit when you either decide to use it or leave. That is essential. An extinguisher is a first aid tool for small fires only, not for a conflagration. Do not put yourself in harm's way and always call the fire department. Always call the fire department. There was a fire in a large home in Quincy. 
it had an incredibly long driveway leading to this lodge of home. Okay? What happened is this gentleman and a woman on a Sunday morning were cooking. They had a fire. He believed the fire was extinguished. They went into the dining room and ate. All of a sudden they heard the sirens of apparatus. The apparatus is coming right up the driveway. The gentleman comes out waving. The fire is out. Picture this. The house is behind him. Meanwhile, the fire extended into the walls and the smoke was coming out of the eaves over the second floor. Can you picture that? The fire is out. Meanwhile, it is already extended up into the attic. So there's an acronym to use an extinguisher, um, to teach people how to use an extinguisher. PASS, P-A-S-S. -S. Keep six to eight feet away from the fire, exit behind you. The P is to pull a pin, okay? The A is to aim the extinguisher at the base of the fire. This typically, there can be a flexible knowledge, a nozzle, or the nozzle itself. The first S is to squeeze the levers together, which you're allowed to do when you take that pin out. And the second S is to sweep at the base of the fire. Okay? Questions on use of extinguisher? Do you want me to get one in the corridor and come back? So here is a typical fire extinguisher. Um, let's see here. We have the trash barrel, class A fire, flammable liquids, Class B, energized electrical equipment. You also have A, B, and C. The, ac the acronym to use is PASS. Pass me that extinguisher. Make sure the exit's behind you. Small contained fire. If in doubt, get out. P-A-S-S, -S. pull the pin. Sometimes if you can't break the plastic, just pull and twist. There's your P. Exit behind me. A, aim at the base of the fire, six to eight feet away. The first S is to squeeze these handles together, and the second S is sweep back and forth at the base of the fire. You can, you can buy one on Amazon, you can buy one at Lowe's, you can buy one at any Ace Hardware, at Curry, on and on and on and on. And now this is a 10 pound extinguisher. The weight is determined by the content but it would be more practical at your own home to have, let's say, a two and a half pound. Yeah, great device. I have them in the shed, I have them in the garage, I have them in the basement, wherever there's a potential. On a commercial property, a company like Gorham will come every year and they have to check these visually uh, and change the tag. In a commercial property, um, including a building like your own, every five to six years, depending upon one type, they actually have to take them and maintain them. In household use, we're not held under those same requirements. So as I say, see this arrow is in the green. If it's in the green, as far as I'm concerned, I'm gonna keep it around. On, on these, they do refill them. On the ones you're gonna get at, at Lowe's, you're not gonna refill them. They're not going to. I don't know, you know, since COVID, everything's gone up. I used to say like $24. I don't know now. This isn't. This is, this is a dry chemical, ammonium phosphate. And it comes out as a yellowish, uh, yellowish powder. However, before you consider using an extinguisher in a small household fire, inform other occupants to leave the building, make certain the fire department is notified, and make certain that you have an escape route. Let me tell you something. How often I responded and people would apologize to me. I'm sorry you had to come. For whatever reason, they were concerned about something, an odor. That's what we're there for. How often would people say, don't send the apparatus a truck, send a car down. Well, that's not going to happen. So we show up, we're there to provide service for your welfare. If in doubt about using it, leave the premise immediately. Shut the door behind you to minimize the air feeding the fire. Remember, do not place yourself in harm's way. Okay? Uh, I've got a couple of more if you're interested. Uh, this one I think is fascinating. And this is about CO detectors. A lieutenant came to me in the morning and said, Cap, you've got to write an article on this. 
The other day I approached by a lieutenant who conveyed the details of an incident he felt had some educational value for the public. Hearing it, I agreed. It has to do with a recent carbon monoxide incident when alarms were activated and in one instance ignored. Now this was a townhouse arrangement with attached townhouses. Attached townhouses. It's unfortunate in a way where a day earlier I was interviewed on cable access TV by Mark Crosby on this very subject, carbon monoxide, CO. Well, I would love to have had the opportunity to share the circumstances of this incident on that show. Conveying the actual incidents can be a learning experience for us all, especially if you can see ourselves responding the way others have or haven't, and consequently learn from their actions. So, let me take this opportunity to convey some of the details of this incident and ask what would you have done if your carbon monoxide alarm had activated. At around 8.30 p.m., Engine 1 was called to a condo unit within a multi-unit dwelling to investigate the activation of a carbon monoxide alarm. Upon entry into that unit using our equipment, the fire department equipment, a positive carbon monoxide reading was found, extremely high reading confirming that the condo's owner's alarm activation was warranted and not a malfunction. You get it? The problem the lieutenant and his crew had to solve was there were no fossil fuel burning appliances within the condo. Carbon monoxide detects the burning, the exhaust products from gas stoves, from fireplaces, from wood burning stoves, from oil burners, etc. This unit had none of that. None of that. Um, fossil fuel burning equipment is any appliance utilizing natural gas, propane, fuel oil, coal, or wood as a source of energy. Neither of the appliances, the heating unit or stove, utilize these sources of energy. So where did, was the CO coming from? A firefighter knocked on another door to speak with the owners of that condo unit. They were all attached. Their CO detector had been an alarm earlier, while in this instant the owner removed the battery in the detector, assuming the alarm was a malfunction, and never called the fire department. Okay? You had someone who was aware of the activation, called the fire department. You had someone that removed the battery. Readings were taken in that unit with our equipment, and higher CO concentrations were found. So they were living in, a, in, a, in an environment with high concentrations of carbon monoxide. Remember, carbon monoxide is poisonous, odorless, colorless, and tasteless. You're not going to know about it. Without the installation of a CO detector, its presence can be undetected. As the first condo unit, this unit too was devoid of fossil fuel burning equipment. So where was the CO coming from? Investigating the entire building, a gas-fired water heater was found at the far end of the building. This would be a utility room with hot water heaters within it, multiple hot water heaters fed by gas. Earlier in the day, a roof company, roof work was performed and a top hole was draped over the roof along the sides of the building. Now these Hot water heaters were vented by what's called sidewall vents. No chimney, sidewall vents. The top pollen draped over these. So as the, the water heaters were exhausting carbon monoxide, CO2, etc., it wasn't going into the atmosphere outside. It was going up the top pollen and re-entered the building. Um, what what these workers neglected to realize, in doing so, they were blocking the sidewall vent. Combustion gases from that gas water heater, CO included, were then redirected back into the building. The, corner, the condo owner was called when his detector activated, did the right thing. The condo owner who called did the right thing. The tragedy was avoided by the subsequent investigation and actions of the lieutenant and his crew. The second condo owner assumed the alarm was a malfunction and ignored it. Every residential occupancy must now conform to Nicole's law and have properly placed working carbon monoxide alarms. 
If you haven't installed them already, please do so. You can call us here in Fire Prevention. I gave you the number. We look forward to assisting you. So carbon monoxide te detectors should be on level, every level of your home. Now, as it was explained to me years ago, and I still uh, believe in this, um, in your basement, you have an oil burner, gas heater. But if you don't spend any time, you have a washer and dryer, but you spend no time down there, you're not required to have a CO detector. That's from the state fire marshal. On the first floor level, you are required to have one. On the second floor, or outside a bedroom, 10 feet outside a bedroom on the first floor. On the second floor, if the bedrooms are up there, you have to have one centrally located as long as it conforms to that 10 foot from the bedroom door. Escape planning. This is the other idea. So basically, we've gone through behavioral patterns, consider changing them, smoke detectors, CO detectors, and now we're going to get into consider escape planning like my father did when we were young. Embracing the message. This one is a local resident. I happened to speak with a woman who recently had a fire within their home. And while she conveyed the proactive life safety measures she and her family had taken prior to the incident. In view of the fire incident, she was so pleased. This woman came up to me. She said, are you the captain in the fire prevention? I said, yes. Can I tell you a story? I said, yeah, sure. She was so pleased that she had taken the active role with her family, having updated her smoke detectors, her CO detectors, and practiced an in-house evacuation drill with the family, including young children. When I used to speak at uh, elementary schools, uh, we would encourage them, we would give them forms, charts, to take home and to create an evacuation um, a plan with their parents. It was called the Edith program, exit drills in the home. Meanwhile, the pleasure of the conversation was all mine. Listening to the active role this family had taken towards a safer residence, she accepted the fire prevention method message, made it her own, and shared it with me with a sense of accomplishment and pride, which she should have. She explained how she and her husband had sat down with their children and designed an evacuation plan together. She then proceeded through the mechanics of implementing that plan. They discussed the importance of their fire alarm system and an alternate means of escaping the house should a typical means of, of doing so be blocked by fire or smoke. They discussed the importance of shutting a door to the seat of the fire to mitigate the migration of fire mitigating into the means of egress. Without acknowledging the acronym EDITH, this family was practicing that concept. This concept encourages families to work together to develop a practice in evacuating from a plan. She no sooner did this, she had a kitchen fire. Okay? And her family responded, they knew exactly what they wanted to do. And in these plans, you're not instilling fear. You want to get out of, away from that concept that I'm going to leave the house like you do Sunday through Monday. You want to know that you might not be able to do so. And what would I do in the event I couldn't? Um, and they had a meeting place. Let me tell you how important this is. One of the fatalities I, I witnessed was there was an illegal apartment over a garage. And... Um, one gentleman, it was two bedroom, one gentleman was smoking. Uh, his blood alcohol level was very high. He was smoking in bed. Um, the fire flashed over, which means all the contents went up, probably 1,600 degrees, 1,700 degrees. The gentleman in the other bedroom got up, stood up to put his pants on and to leave the, the apartment like he did every other day, okay? No smoke detector, there were smoke detectors, no batteries. So what happened was he stood up, he had one burn here, he took one or two breaths, the super eater, heated air killed him right there. My point of the story is this, two arms length away, closer than that window, he had windows to escape from. But he never considered that alternate means of potentially um, escaping that room and he succumbed. And Mark and I have done programs in off-campus housing. Let's say my child was going to LSU or some, some college and was living in on-campus housing. And he or she 
was in a, an apartment without proper protection, CO detector. I would then recommend for that individual, rather than installing it, if they didn't have the uh, opportunity to do so, the ladder, the appliance, the screwdrivers, to have a CO detector and place it in that case, particularly if it's rated for a ceiling on top of something. Yes. Yeah. Great question. And this is the type of book, you're not going to sit and read it cover to cover. This is the type of book where if there's something on TV and you're bored by it, pick it up next to your recliner and read a couple of articles. So, hey, you've all been a delight. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much.